I'm going to go on and, and kick this meeting off. I'm sure we'll have a couple people fill in afterwards. Um, first off, I want to thank um, everyone for joining. Uh, this is the speaker series for Midwest University. I, I want to thank ATG, uh, the host for this event. Um, ATG is the official reseller of Binbox Workstations. I'm the director of products, Buck Davis. But this morning, we are not going to be talking about workstations. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about emerging technology trends in the AEC industry, and we have a really good panel today, um, some heavy hitters in the industry. Um, today, we are joined by Kelly Cohn. He is the Vice President of Industry Strategy at ClearEdge 3D. ClearEdge 3D is a software provider that automates scan to BIM, as well as construction verification workflows. Um, I also have Ryan Cameron. He is the Digital Practice Leader at CMBA Architecture. CMBA is a mid-sized architecture firm based in the Midwest, has adopted innovation in all aspects of their practice. Um, and we also have Brad Clark. Brad is a VDC lead at Apollo Mechanical. Apollo Mechanical is an MEP firm in the Northwest, fully integrated in BIM from design to fabrication with revenues over 600 million. So thank you all for joining us today. Um, I want to kick this off with a little bit to let people know who y'all are. Uh, they might not know who you are. I'm sure if they go to trade shows, they probably met at least one of you. And, and if they watch podcasts uh, talking about BIM, they probably bumped into one of y'all. Um, or if you've used your Revit benchmark, you probably know one of y'all. Um, so uh, first off, I want to get some background information. Um, tell us kind of who you are, your background, uh, where you've worked, how you got to where you are today and what you do today. So I'm gonna start that out with Kelly. Um, give us the Kelly Cone history, present, past, and what you do. The boring story, all yeah. right. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I uh, went to architecture school, thought I would you know, be the next Brinzo Piano or you know, something like that. Um, you know, like all architecture school students uh, think they're gonna graduate and design beautiful buildings. Um, got my bachelor's and master's at uh, UT, Hook'em Horns. Uh, and uh, went to work at a really cool company, uh, the Bet Group uh, design build uh, firm, uh, which is something I was passionate about. Uh, and uh, <laughs> spent my first year drawing bathroom elevations like all good architecture students uh, <laughs> uh, and hated it uh, like all good architecture students. And so I uh, got the opportunity to be on our first Revit project uh, at the firm, which was a uh, hot smoking disaster. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we kind of got asked at the end why it went wrong. Uh, and it turned out it actually had nothing to do with the software. Uh, it had everything to do with, you know, rolling people through the job, learning curve, all this other stuff. Um, so we decided to give it another try. Um, I, being a Texas boy, I like to tell the story of like, like the Alamo where they draw the line in the sand. And it's like anybody that wants to stay, you know, cross the line, anybody else you can leave, nobody will hate you. Right. So in my firm, it was like, they were like, who wants to run the Revit implementation? And everybody else knew to step backwards. <clears throat> and so I'm like the one idiot going, huh? So uh, ended up running Revit uh, implementation and uh, then ran our VDC team uh, after that, uh, grew it to about 20 people uh, with in-house laser scanning and scan to BIM services, uh, scheduling, um, uh, BIM, 3D coordination, uh, uh, estimating out of the BIMs, all that kind of fun stuff. And then decided it was time for change, uh, jumped into uh, one of our vendors, uh, ClearEdge 3D, which helped us with, as you said, automating the scan to BIM process and uh, construction verification and uh, started running product there and then moved into industry strategy about two years ago. And funny story, actually just moved back into product three weeks ago. So I'm running product again, um, but haven't updated my signature. So Nice, nice. So I got to ask though, so you went from architecture to BIM VDC, and now you're kind of all in a laser scanning. What about laser scanning and point clouds and this, this value in point clouds and making them mean something kind of caught your attention and made that be your focus, right? Because everybody kind of finds that trajectory that they like or that, that focus that they want to go in. What about point clouds and laser scanning made you say, hey, this is me? 
I, I think, I mean, partially it's just cool. Yeah. I, I have lasers in my house at all times. There's a laser, laser. right there. Yeah. Um, but uh, I think both on the design side and on the construction side, you know, I saw how much of a challenge we have as an industry with understanding what's actually there. Um, that's true even on, you know, uh, uh, green build, you know, just, just ground up construction, but it's especially true on renovation work. Um, and um, yeah, I just, uh, I really enjoyed kind of the ability to have a lot of knowledge about the existing conditions going into the design process. On, on the construction side, I ended up on a Renzo piano job, actually, uh, the Kimball Art Museum in Fort Worth, and uh, I got to meet my hero. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, um, never meet your heroes. Uh, mm-hmm. But, um, you know, on that job, we had all sorts of problems with getting stuff installed in the right place. And then there's like, ah, well, this thing that was so useful for design, it can be so useful for construction. And, you know, just, it's such an amazing tool. And it's, it's feeds into the process in a lot of really positive and reinforcing ways if you do it right. And uh, it just, just seemed like a great tool to make things, make life better uh, awesome. for people designing and building buildings. Awesome, Kelly. Well, thanks for joining us today. Um, Brian, I'm coming to you next, man. Uh, give us your background. How did you get to CMBA in, in architecture, right? I think everyone on the panel today started in architecture, but you have like I, I've pursued in this it, all the way. Well, it, ironically, I'd, maybe I should, shouldn't admit this, but I actually have an engineering degree. I got it when I was 19 and then, <laughs> then went into architecture. So not quite the, the purest anymore. I've, I've right. my reputation, but right. you know, I actually come from, from both backgrounds um, and I actually grew up in a hardware store. So I've, I've got an understanding of at very least the, the tools and how to put things together and how to repair things. Um, my mother would always hand me something and say, hey, if you can fix this power drill vacuum, you can keep it. And so that got me really interested in, in how things work and how they come apart and how to put it back together. And then my dad re- kind of ran the computer-ish side of that business. And so I learned DOS at a very early age and how to program. But for the most part, yeah, then went on to University of Nebraska, go Huskers. We're in the Big Ten now, Kelly, but, you know, that's that's how it goes sometimes. Um, working at CMBA, I think a lot of people know that I'm, I was at DLR for a long time and, and a few other firms besides that. But going to college at UNL, um, actually went to college at the same time as like a Dave Patera, De Rofus, Nate Miller, Proving Ground, Nate Holland. I think he's running the computational side of MBBJ. Zach Softland's running Layer right now. Matt Conway's at Gary Technologies. Just a really crazy time in that like 07 to 2012 era of, of UNL College of Architecture. Just a lot of amazing uh, people coming out of that. Um, for right now, CMBA it gave me kind of the opportunity of a lifetime to, to really help be their innovation leader and digital practice leader. And so what that means is um, continuing to help coach and support the firm's design technology initiatives, um, help chair the R&D subcommittee research and action. Um, notable accomplishments just in the past year of, of being here include um, implementing KA Connect synthesis, the, en- the evolution of firm's rendering processes, um, implementation of uh, mobile strategy, as, as Buck is, is familiar with, um, increased robustness of the Dell Tech products that we use, implement GIS data technology and databasing efforts that have led to new revenue sources, um, help and acquire and launch the first, uh, as I mentioned, CMBA mobile fleet for the entire company. And then as of yesterday, we actually signed a contract to initiate our reality capture later scan services agreement with the client in sort of a, a, a side partnership with Microsoft. So oh. a lot of, lot of interesting connections just in the last 12 months of, of me being here. It's, it's been an absolutely incredible roller coaster ride. And of course, all of that during COVID. So um, yeah, we're, we're kicking it. Well, you know, and, and I think that's really interesting because I know you and I have had sidebar conversations and I, and I think bigger isn't always better. Um, and I think a lot of people kind of struggle with that. I, they want to work at a big company, right? Because there's all this glamour and glitz and they, wow, I worked for so-and-so. Um, but I know that, that, that you've had really, really big success going to that mid-sized firm that kind of had buy-in on the process and, and let you kind of have free reigns on things. I mean, am I, am I spot on that? Or, or what, what was the difference going from a DLR to a CMBA that, 
you know, it's a huge firm, right? I mean, it's when I say midsize, it's a big not firm. I, yeah, not when um, I started. But what what did what what was the difference for you? Yeah, um, just a little bit more opportunity. The you know, just different different flavor of leadership, I would say, um, in terms of what they would allow me to do, what I could do, what I couldn't do. Um, and I think what changed it was I was asked to be the um, keynote speaker for AIA Iowa, and a lot of CEOs around the uh, local area uh, saw that and, and what happened to reach out to me and say, hey, can you do that but here? <laughs> so um, we, we went off and running. And, you know, when I when I started at uh, DLR, they were probably about 500, 550. And I think they grew to about 1500 in, in just the almost seven years that I was there. So, you know, things change and you got to be able to adapt. And sometimes you outgrow something that's growing too large, something like that. And yep. you need to step back and uh, just gain a new perspective and yeah, just I get, I get to do what, whatever I want to do, which is, <laughs> great, which is help people. Right. And, and lead a couple teams and promote from within and, and create opportunities for everyone. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thanks for joining today. And uh, Brad, Brad, you're, you're a good friend. You're a long time, um, I guess, the user of Gunbox. But um, I, 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 uh, I know you have your new role at Apollo. I know you were at Clark Construction. Um, give me the background on, on Brad Clark. Um, w- w- how'd you get started? What have you done? And, and where are you now? Sure. So I went to school at the University of Idaho. Uh, started my undergrad in virtual technology and design, which is focused on 3D modeling, animations, and simulations. Uh, from there, I moved on to get my master's in architecture. And after that, kind of took a little turn and worked on my PhD in education, uh, but focused on educational technologies. Um, from there, I got picked up at Washington State University, which is just across the border from the U of I. Uh, I was their educational technology researcher there. So any uh, new or upcoming technologies that could be used for education, uh, I'd do research on it and work with faculty to figure out how best to implement it for uh, either improving student engagement or just overall learning. Um, At the time, Clark Construction was building a new building for Washington State University. Uh, They called it the Digital Classroom Building, and it was focused on classrooms that were uh, centered around technology and the use of technology and learning. Uh, So I helped with some of the design of the classrooms that were in there and the technologies associated with them, and then ended up becoming the coordinator for the building uh, once it was complete. And so during closeout and everything, I worked really closely with the Clark Construction team that was there, really got to know them. Um, You know, after about a year and a half of the building up and running, uh, I was approached by the executive of that project from Clark, asked me if I was interested in kind of shifting gears and going over to, to Clark to work on VDC, um, primarily focused at the time on doing 40 simulations for him. Um, so I hopped over there for that opportunity, went to their SeaTac project, which is a billion dollar project over there. It's an expansion on SeaTac that finishes up, uh, I think, July of this year. Um, hopped into doing the 40 simulations and then from there moved on to running coordination um, and then just slowly expanded into a bunch of different things uh, nationally going anything from you know hardware specs and selection all the way to helping design some of the uh, training and standards around coordination. Um, I was kind of their go-to guy for being sent off to projects that were kind of running behind on coordination and figuring out how we can get them back on track. Um, And then from there, kind of wanted a a change of pace and hopped over to Apollo Mechanical. Um, They actually worked on this CTAC project with us. Um, And so now I'm focused on really helping them with some of their Revit standards. They just switched over to Revit about two years ago from CAD. Um, So working on that, working on some coordination standards as well. trying to help solve problems where I can. I know, I know you, you also have done some laser scanning. I know Ryan touched on it. Kelly touched on it. I know your SeaTac project, y'all had a pretty interesting use case for laser scanning as far as that pick you had to make for that sky bridge. Can you kind of walk me through how you leverage laser scanning on that and why it made it kind of useful? I know the tolerances were kind of crazy. 
Yeah, so so the SeaTac project had what, what they called a pedestrian walkway, but it was basically a bridge that was over the taxiway. So once the planes land and they come in to park at the gates, um, the bridge spanned across that, that taxiway between the runway and the gates. Um, but the way that it was built is they had two sections on either end that were built in place, but that center section that was about 330 feet long was built in one of the cargo lots um, at the other end of the airport. And so the, the biggest problem with that is it was so large and the, the tolerances for the steel were so specific um, that we had to make sure that everything was dialed in because we could only close that section of the taxiway for um, a total of seven days. And so that, that was everything from the time that we had to put it on these movers, bring them down, jack it up into place, do all the welds. All the welds were a minimum of, a, of 100 passes and you had to get inspected after every 10 passes. Um, and we were within like two inches. Um, you, we couldn't be with outside of two inches of tolerance, plus or minus two inches of tolerance, um, both vertically and horizontally with the, with both the steel and the, the enclosure. And so the problem was we had these two structures on either end, but then we also had what we were building out in the cargo area that was up on blocks um, being built. And we had to make sure that when it went up into place that everything lined up. We had some adjustments on either ends with these cables that would either pull the ends in or out a little bit, but we had very little. Um, so we would go through, um, you know, once steel was actually fabricated and put together, went through and did a scan. Um, after that, once concrete was laid out, we went out and did a scan and we were checking based off of structural tolerances of how much camber would actually settle in as we started adding more and more weight. Um, so, you know, as we started going, NEP going in, curtain wall, um, you know, that way we could check every once in a while to make sure that we were within tolerance and there were times that we weren't. And so we would use that to help problem solve of, okay, what adjustments do we actually need to make here to make sure that we're back in alignment? It, it sometimes raises the question when I think about that without laser scanning, it's like, you know, Kelly, do we used to just get lucky every now and then? I mean, <laughs> when you think about how you were in bread, I, if Clark had tried to do that back in the day, were we just getting lucky? I mean, it was it seven days was a joke, Kelly. How, I mean, how would, I, yeah, you know he, what I mean, I don't know what to do with my hands. It's almost like a Ricky Bobby moment. Like, yeah. We, we just try. Um, but, you know, I think this is a great example, you know, how would Thank Verity you, help that out? Is that an edge wise or is that a Verity solution or how would you, how would you look at that? I mean, for, for us, that'd be a Verity solution, but I, I, I mean, you know, in the, in the past people would do it with total stations. You'd set up and you'd shoot a number of points. You just, you didn't have all the information to work with because, you know, you're not going to go shoot 10,000 points or uh, you know, a hundred million points and look for torsion and twist and all this other stuff that you can get out of a laser scan. Um, you know, uh, you know, deformation along the length of the beam, those, those things are just much, much, much harder to get, um, with a total station. So, you know, you would know there was a problem, but diagnosing the cause of the problem is just so much easier when you have more data. I just see, I see Brad nodding his head. Like that's the, that's the beauty of it is, you just have so much more information to work with and figure out what's going wrong. Right. Uh, but, uh, you know, it, it, it wasn't just getting lucky, uh, but it was, you know, and, and you had to design a lot more tolerance if you didn't have these kind of systems. And so, you know, I, I think it does, you know, having these kind of technologies on the table does give people a little bit more freedom uh, to, uh, you know, design things a little bit more precisely, maybe a little bit more elegantly, and have a solid chance of getting those things built, uh, successfully. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, that's, I'm hearing this job and I'm like, Oh, I wish we'd had Verity back then. So I could have gotten that into Brad's hand. That would have been an amazing <laughs> project for a case study. Cause like, that's just like, that's bread and butter for Verity. That's like, Oh, let me, let me take that process that took you three days to check everything and turn it into something that takes you three hours to check everything because, you know, we'll, we'll do parts of it for you. But, uh, right. And, and I, and I, I was shaking my eyes. Like I probably should have told him about Verity. <laughs> so that's on me. Um, 
So next, the question I have, and I'm going to have to kind of I'm gonna add a little bit to it. So all of y'all are leaders of innovation at what you do. Kelly, you're back now in product. They dropped you from strategy to product. Um, <laughs> you're demoted to making things good again. I'm just kidding. Um, so all of y'all are leaders of innovation at your company. Um, I want to know, where do you see the direction of innovation in your field going? What's the most exciting thing on the horizon? And when I when I say that, I mean, what's the horizon right now? Like if you take a snapshot, what are you excited right now? And then let's say if you had a magic wand, everything fell in line, where would you want to see things going, right? Because um, there are limitations of what we can do right now, right? They're physics, they're all this other stuff. Um, so those are three questions. Where do you see direction going? What's the most exciting thing now? And then if if there weren't the limitations, where would you want to see things going? I'll start with you, Kelly. Yeah. All righty, man. Uh, gosh, I was like, oh, since I just spoke, I'll have time to think about this before yeah. I answer. Well, we can switch it up. I can. I no. can go. Ryan, let's start with Ryan. I'll I can. Ryan. I can. Okay. I've got plenty of stuff written down here, so okay. I. I, Knock I, it I look out. at. I, I look at McKenzie a lot. I, I look at a lot of different stats and, and other information that are that are out there rather than just base it on my own bias and opinion. But um, a, a stat that I saw was 55% of AEC and manufacturing companies plan to adopt real-time 3D technologies within two years. And so that's that's something that kind of came out really recently here in 2021. So I, I would happen to agree with that. Um, I, I think there's um, some other things um, that are going to be happening due to COVID last year. Um, and one of those things, um, so I'm going to break it down into near, mid, and far. Yep. And so uh, near stuff would be work from home infrastructure. And so a lot of firms and companies are still looking at that technology. And there's a lot that comes with it. I don't think anybody's settled yet. And I hope that they're not because there's security, there's the way things work, how policies that need to be put in place. It, and all that got scrambled together really quickly in you know the last nine months. So it's time to kind of relook at that infrastructure. The other is a communication platform when we all got dispersed and scattered and all that. Boy, oh boy, did <laughs> Teams and Zoom and all of those things that are out there become really hypercritical. So I, I think in the near term, getting those really settled um, and, and thought about again, like Adam Grant's book, Think Again, which just came out, uh, really rethink uh, how those things got implemented. Um, over the mid, and this is kind of the two to five year, three to five year thought, invest in staff. And that is a technology investment. Um, that is strategies for hiring and retaining next gen. Now that everything's changed, you're, again, your work from home, it's, it's a snowball effect, right? So technology is, is a big component of that. Um, and being able to ask them about what their dream process is in terms of workflow, working from home or, or not. Ask them about their career path. And then learning opportunities that help elevate them, as opposed to learning about the history of the company that they that they work for. Maybe it's something that's a little bit more about elevating them to get to the next level. So that's that's what I'm all about. And then five years out, because it's going to take five years, new services. And I break those into. Um, and here's maybe the the key takeaway here um, for me today is new services external and new services internal. A lot of people just think sell, sell, sell to clients. Um, and in this case, those things that you can sell externally would be your AR, VR, XR type of technologies, getting those those working and functioning. Digital twin, the greatest buzzword of 2020, maybe even 2019. That's a real thing. We've been doing digital twinning for, I mean, every single Revit model is technically a digital twin. So it's just been plus, right? Um, Real-time 3D, as I mentioned earlier, reality capture. I, it's everywhere. It's starting to get, it's becoming everywhere now. It's everywhere I look. So that's a big trend. Um, and, and I was going to mention this next one. I am going to, I'm not going to cross off my list. I might come back to this, but this one's new to me as we begin to create assets for this. Um, so I'm going to hang on to that one for a second. I'm going to switch to the ex internal new services and that'll be automation creation. That's getting to CDs faster or something like that. A, a new cool rabbit button, whatever that is. Um, collaboration technology, not just communication, but collaboration. It's a completely different technology. And then energy analysis. I think that can be done better for buildings as architects and engineers progress through their careers. I think energy is going to be a, a huge um, internal and external cell. 
Awesome. Cool. Now, you hit, you think you hit a lot. You're going to, I guess, Brad and Kelly, y'all have to, y'all have to work that out. Um, <laughs> plenty, I, plenty of to choose. Yeah, there's, there's plenty of everything to choose from there. Take it so I, I'm going to go, I'm going to Brad next. Kelly, you're going to have to pop way to the last. This is why I'm, you're going to have a hard, I, I teed you up at first and now, now you go last. Um, Brad, what do you, what are your thoughts? Um, most innovative thing, mechanical or general contracting, or, you know, what are you thinking for the industry? You know, what, what, what would you like to see? I mean, what do you think the most exciting things are right now? Well, thanks for setting the bar high, Ryan. Appreciate it. Yeah. <laughs> you uh, can pick you back on those. You can go from them or, or talk about whatever you want to talk about. Tons of pizza to eat there, man. You got it. Yeah. No, I think, you know, one of the things that I've been really interested in for quite a while now, um, that, that's not reality capture. I mean, I love reality capture and really see the potential. Um, but I think Kelly can definitely speak to that a lot more than I can. Uh, for me, it's prefab. Um, I think it has a ton of potential to really change the speed, the efficiency, and some of the workflows. Uh, that, that take place, especially on design build projects, um, you know, really getting coordination and the overall design nailed down earlier. Um, I, I think it helps solve a lot of problems with, um, you know, what I've seen on just about every project that I've been on that's been design build is, um, you know, you, you hit a point where you're at 100% CDs and then eventually you start seeing these RFIs and change orders that keep coming in that are some, some additions or adjustments made in the design, whether it's asked from uh, the owner or some adjustments on the architect side or engineers or whatever, but it, it just continues to change more and more. And I think if we can really start pushing prefab and have the understanding of that process really nailed down by all members of, of the project team, um, it'll really help with the overall flow of the project, you know, really nailing things down um, and that's everything from pre-built walls to rack systems, um, uh, central utility plants, you know, cups, having those built, you know, offsite before you bring them in. And I know some of this is already being done, um, but I think it's still got a ways to go and a lot of opportunity to really start refining that, um, that process overall. I know there's a lot of people looking at it. Um, you know, the, a lot of the MEP subs have been on it for a long time. Um, and GCs are just kind of starting to dabble in it a little bit. Uh, so I think there's a lot of opportunity there for everybody. Um, you know, where things are going, you know, fuck, you know, one of the things that I harp on a lot is making sure that everybody has the tools that they actually need to get all of this done, right? A, a lot of the things that we talk about where, you know, where we see people going, um, with their processes and with the software that they're using, right, is catching up with that with the hardware that you actually have and the tools you have to be able to get that stuff done, right? And I think there's a lot of GCs and subs and architecture firms who are just kind of like riding that wave of the big three, you know, Dell, HP, Lenovo, and they just keep getting like the next version that's out and they're just they're not able to keep up with all of, whether it's the laser scanning updates to Revit and Dynamo and the processing power that's actually needed to really push innovation, you know, in the construction industry. Um, you know, I think really trying to get people on board and really understanding that it's, it's time to step things up on the hardware side of things to really get the ball rolling to where you're not sitting there waiting for, you know, 20, 30 minutes for things to load. I mean, when I was at Clark, um, one of the things that I was really proud of was, not getting, um, not getting the bin box, you know, and everything set up for, for everybody in VDC, but getting all of the engineers and um, project engineers, new laptops that were what, what Clark considered their BIM laptops. And it was because, I mean, I was sitting at SeaTac with, you know, 30 engineers around and we had meetings at 7 a.m. And I'd wait, everybody'd be waiting till like 7.30 for Bluebeam and Kahua to open up or people would be getting blue screens. Like they couldn't work. They'd sit there and spend probably two hours a day waiting for their computer to process stuff. And it was frustrating on my end and they just dealt with it for so long that finally when I got them swapped over to a computer that was what they actually needed to get their job done, like everybody just ranted and raved about how happy they were that like they could actually get stuff done. 
And I think and that's- for the record, those project engineer systems were not BIM boxes. You just got them a better computer than the yeah. DPOs that they were using beforehand, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So that wasn't like a monumental upgrade. It was just no. the, the bad ThinkPad to the better ThinkPad, right? Um, yeah. <laughs> so no, no, I'll let you finish. I just wanted to point that out, right? So. Yeah, no, and, and that's the thing. Like, it's not, it's not like this push to say everybody needs the best of everything, right? Like, you got to, you got to look at the the ROI and you know, everything that that's involved with that, and making sure that you're making the correct decision, right? Like, people who are just going through doing RFI submittals, hopping in the model every once in a while, doing Bluebeam markups, like they're not going to need the best of the best to get their work done, right? And and IT and everybody, you know, the CFOs, they're not going to look at it and be like, oh yeah, let's you know, let's spend a huge chunk of change on this. It's like, no, let's, let's take what, whatever the best option is, you know, to get that going forward. Um, you know, so for them, it wasn't, it wasn't exactly like a, a bin box, bin box laptop at the time, but, you know, I think as we continue to progress through and start um, incorporating more technology into, you know, the, the office side of things, you know, for the GCs that, you know, there's potential for that to actually come where there's a need for that. Got you. And um, Kelly, since you're, I hope you're ready now. Now you follow in two pretty good answers. Yeah, no, I'm, 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 I, I love it. It's great because now I can actually respond, right? So, <laughs> you know, like I to totally agree. You know, the, a, lot, a lot of these things are just, you know, on their own, they're just technologies. It's like what you use it for that matters. So like, yeah, laser scanning is cool, but unless, you know, you're using it to facilitate prefab or to facilitate verification or to get existing conditions and, all it is is just changing how you get those things, right? That's that's what technology is supposed to do. It's a tool. It's not a product in and of itself. Um, you know, at least when applied to practice, right? right. Uh, digital twins, same thing, right? Like, I mean, hey, it's the laser scanning guy. I love digital twins, right? You know, it's 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 giving a nice, catchy, shiny name to you know something that helps me sell products, right? So, yay! But like, you know, the digital twin is a myth because like we've been doing it. We're going to keep doing it. It's in contracts. Like it's, and there's not going to be just one. Like, I'm sure you guys both remember like back when it was like, oh, there will be one Revit model and the engineer and the architect and the, everybody will be contributing to this one magical Revit model and everything <laughs> will be together. And it's like the BIM. Yeah, that didn't happen because... Um, <laughs> You know, digital twins is like the same stuff. It's like what's cool about it, right? Is you know, they're the uses for the digital twins that we make are getting more varied, more computational, more interesting, and that comes with new requirements. But uh, you know, every time I hear digital twins, I always tell people, you know, it's it's digital octuplets. That's actually what it is, um, because there's a lot of digital twins. Uh, you don't get just one. Um, it's a package deal. But I think, you know, the trend I'm most excited about, um, and this is something I used to harp on, you know, 10 years ago at conferences about BIM, like the, everybody thinks the M in BIM stands for model as in 3D model, but that's not what it actually stands for. It means like weather model or financial model, like the point of BIM, the reason why the I is so important is you use the B, which is the building, the 3D portion that, that you use the I, all the data and stuff that you would tag and associate with it to do predictive analysis, which is called modeling. And so like, I'm super excited to see, you know, all these different types of modeling that are actually mm -hmm. happening now, whether it's using laser scanning and doing all this comparison stuff, um, you know, uh, you know, for SeaTac, like Brad was talking about, to make sure stuff will go in right or real time rendering. Like, oh, I remember, you know, 10 years ago going to a SIGGRAPH, uh, like my first non AEC conference, and they had like real time rendering for cars. And I was like, this is going to be huge. And it just took 10 years to trickle down to AEC because none of us <laughs> wanted to spend 140K, you know, for a single license of a real time rendering software. Um, but you know, like that modeling stuff is just, you know, I feel like BIM is finally starting to deliver on its promise uh, in ways that it just couldn't, you know, 10 years ago due to computational limitations. But, and then I'm super jazzed kind of longer term about um, seeing developers more integrated with practice, 
right? And so, like, I, I don't know if you guys know, uh, uh, Hovard, uh, you know, has got Reop. There's, you know, there were obviously, you know, companies like Case that were, you know, created. These are companies that are like basically de delivering development as a service to AEC firms to help them streamline, optimize, automate their processes. And, you know, at some point that's not going to be a third party company. That's just going to be having software developers sitting in house, you know, sitting in a quad, you know, with an architect and, you know, uh, the designer and everybody else working on projects going like, oh, don't spend 16 hours doing that. I'll just write up a little algorithm and <laughs> we'll get that done for you. Um, and so I'm just, I'm really excited to see that trend over the next 10 years, because I, I think that's going to have a huge impact on the kind of work and the efficiency uh, uh, that, that we can kind of complete that work. And therefore, the, the time we can spend more and more so on design and uh, making so really I, cool stuff. I've got I've got to ask you about that. So this is this is something that I've I, I love that. I think that answer is beautiful. Um, I feel like right now and this is my question for you. The AEC um, investment boom, anytime there's a decent plugin that could be developed into something great, someone throws $100 million at it, it gets rolled up into a plugin for a mainstream software, and then the development dies, and that's that. You know what I mean? Like when we see some of the money that's being thrown, I loved, uh, was it Placemaker? I, I was like, you can import locations, buildings, and topos with material maps baked into a Revit. And they're like, yeah, they were bought for $350 million. And I was like, almost had a heart attack. I was like, InfoWorks exists. They could do this already. <laughs> but like, I mean, don't you fear that like all these great innovations just get cut too soon? I mean, there's, that the development stops because of the investment money being thrown at it. Is that, is that wrong or is that wrong for me to think that? No, I mean, that's not wrong to think that. It doesn't always happen that way. I, I think it's, um, you know, that's probably a little too cynical. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I do think, you know, some of, some of these companies get good investments and are able to keep developing. I think others, you know, don't. And then we, we see things like flux that, you know, that the, the, you know, that didn't die because of money that just died because there was no business model. Right. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it's one of these things where, you know, I think our, our industry, one of the big barriers that, that, that our industry struggles with in terms of adopting technologies and, and really leveraging technologies to the fullest extent is just, how siloed and fractured our industry is and the kind of contractual um, muck that has built up over, you know, the last century um, that, you know, we, Autodesk had a beautiful idea to make it to where everybody could, you know, collaborate on a single BIM, but it'll never happen. Not because that's a bad idea or the technology sucks. It's because contracts don't allow it. The, the, the risk mitigation strategies in our industry basically prohibit that kind of, that level of uh, cooperation and collaboration. Um, and so, you know, that's a struggle for startups. Like Flex is a great example where the value chain out of Flex really was distributed across the entire, um, you know, the entire infra, you know, ecosystem, but no one player got enough value to ever pay much money for it. Right. And so it dies. And that, that I see that happen all the time. And that's why I think a lot of these startups have to turn to money from the big, you know, the, the big players like Autodesk or somebody else, because they cap out pretty quick on what they can earn in revenue and what their growth, you know, unless you've got like a just really broadly applicable tool, um, like a Bluebeam, but even, you know, they got acquired too, but, you know, but if you've got like a broadly applicable tool, then you can grow before the acquisition uh, happens. But otherwise, you know, a lot of, a lot of AEC startups, they kind of hit a plateau. And they just, they struggle, but it's, to me, that's not a money problem. That's actually a contract and legal structures problem that we have in our industry. And it just, it, it makes things unnecessarily hard. And, and that's honestly something I don't think anyone ever talks about when they talk about barrier to where we're going to be in 10 years, because until legal structures of contracts and risk management mitigation get out of the way, the whole collaborative 
nature of the industry and, and managing risk and prefab isn't really going to change, is it? I mean, I, I know this is me being cynical, but like every time I was working in a general contractor and I was like, well, we're going to inherit, we're going to take control of this model. And lawyers were like, no, you're not. <laughs> so I, I, I don't want to go too far down that wormhole, but you know, th that until that changes, do you see there being a point where, I mean, all this stuff, great stuff that we can do can happen? Well, I mean, it, the good news is there are wonderful technologies that are highly implementable within a single silo of that. Agree. You know, Agree. Of that value change, right? Like re real-time rendering stuff that, you know, you know, Ryan has talked about, like there's so many things that are just like, it just makes sense for an architectural firm to implement. And, you know, uh, you know obviously prefabrication for a mechanical engineering company, there's tons of pre value that they can, they can get from that internally. And then, you know, okay, then there's some additional out, you know, external values that the entire, the entire ecosystem shares in. But I mean, the, the short answer is it, until contracts change or you have, you know, a successful version of Katera, which is kind of uh, doing the vertical integration strategy, um, you know, until then it's, there are just some things that are yeah, darn near impossible to implement kinda, and focus on what's good. Right. Kind of add to that. Yeah. I mean, we don't even have the vehicle of exchange established let alone the legal the legal jar jargon like even if you cleared that what is the, the the exchange what is what is the vehicle that we put this on to make all the exchanges happen we don't, we don't even have that yet so i i don't know that there's a big rush on on the contract side but there should be and there i completely be. agree with 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 kelly in, on his points but this is where things like blockchain could get introduced and i don't want to go down that wormhole but this is where you need that kind of uh, portal to be able to hand off the ownership and legal subsidies and premises and risk onto an exchange platform it doesn't exist. Um, and so you, the other thing we talked about was um, basically a startup getting acquired. And that was a prediction I made on RSVR's website in 19 and 20. And I said, you're going to continue seeing this. You're going to continue seeing little specialized platforms get gobbled up and maybe they do something and maybe they don't. The problem there is they were never given enough time to build that community and build that following. Uh, we, we use Flux, but I, I wanna even break out further than that and say um, the uh, Bitcoin versus Ethereum kind of example, Bitcoin's gonna be around forever because it's just simply the biggest name, the biggest following, first mover advantage. And you've got a, Ethereum, which most of everything is run on it again in my opinion in terms of nfts so what is that vehicle what is that process for manufacturing for aec for all the other industries that are that are out there medical healthcare, um and it, it simply just doesn't exist so you're going to see these your planned grids and your space planning and, and all those things get get gobbled up and acquired um that's going to continue ladies and gentlemen sorry but but it is Sorry for the sidebar. I, we got one more question and I'm going to have to be brief and then we're going to open it up to Q&A. Um, to anybody listening, if you have questions, go on and type them in the Q&A. And after this next question, um, I'll open it up for questions. So we're going to start with Kelly this time. So you better be prepared. Uh, well, actually, you know, we're going to start with Brad this time and then we'll go, we'll go Ryan and Kelly. You go last again. Um, so 10 years from now, what aspect of the way we do things in the AEC um, will have people scratching their heads saying, why, why do we ever do this? And I stole this question from AEC Magazine. I love this question. And I personally don't know if 10 years is long enough. I think that's what, two, three projects. I don't know if that's a long enough time period, but let's go with 10 years. Okay, so this is kind of wishful thinking for me. Um, because it's, it's one of the things that I get frustrated with a lot, but I still really enjoy doing, and that's running through BIM coordination on projects and really hoping that we can see a lot of change in the, the way that we do this. And I, I mean that holistically. So everything from how you go and do class reports, you know, are you saving out viewpoints? Are you, you know, using BIM track? And like early, earlier on in projects, depending on the size of the project or how complex it is, like you can have thousands of clashes in a single area every time. And, you know, depending on you know, how, you, how well you want to do and, you know, if you're going to do your due diligence as somebody who's running coordination, like 
Are you going through and saving good viewpoints for, for the rest of the trades to go through and be able to coordinate? Or are you going to make them like search around the model to figure out where everything actually is? Like takes a lot of time. Um, yeah, you know, I mentioned BIM track doing the issue tracking, you know, right now, a big one is BIM track. Um, you know, I, I think it's a very useful tool, but at the same time, when you have hundreds to thousands of clashes in, in areas that you have to go and constantly check on and, and close out or open up, it, it's just a lot to process. And even, you know, going with that, like the RFI process. So like when you're going through coordination and we have to move walls, fur walls out, change them, add soffits, everything, you know, that, sometimes it just takes time depending on you know, who you're actually with, with the architect and everything, getting that stuff moving forward um, instead of having to wait for a long time. Um, and I've been on a project where it actually went really smoothly with the process that they were using, but I haven't seen anybody else really do that. Um, and overall, just trying to shorten that timeline down to that, that we're using for um, running coordination. Awesome. Brian, what you got? So one of the head scratching moments, of course, is um, really the way, let's say like one of my clients uh, test fit, the way they can produce a, a building now um, versus back when I used to do mixed family and, and more, you know, mixed use, things like that, multifamily, we would spend a lot of time in SketchUp or even the early days of Revit and things would change. And although it's called revise it, Revit, it really wasn't all that quick to change. And now test fits come out with their platform and it's instant change. So I, I want to give a shout out to them um, as far as manufacturing. And, and I, I think Brad made a couple of points about um, kind of pre-engineered, prefabricated um, construction. I, I think Allied BIM has a really neat program that's that's coming out. Uh, Brian Nickel and his team have been working really hard on that. And so they're working with Tiger Stop um, and being able to basically take the digital twin and fabricate it just instantly. And I think you're going to see a lot more of that happening, uh, almost a mad rush of that happening because of the, the value um, that that brings to the to the table. Um, and then I want to just want to leave everybody with with the question of in the next 10 years, like, so I'm, I'm thinking of a pre Peter Drucker quote, which was the best way to predict the future is to create it. Um, and so I want to leave everybody with the question is, how is your problem framed? What problems are you trying to solve? Are they the problems that are worth your time or are you, you know, solving the wrong problems. So just be sure to frame your problems correctly. Okay. Kelly. Oof. You got a head scratcher? I like, I like that one. I mean, uh, to, to, to me, the, 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 I'm going to bring it home to reality capture to, to me, the, um, yeah, the thing that's just always been a head scratcher is how disconnected the digital processes get from the actual conditions on site. You know, I, I remember spending hours in 3D coordination meetings coordinating around something only to find out that, you know, uh, when we went out on site and looked at it the next day, it actually got installed differently than was shown in the model anyway. And all that time was completely wasted and thrown in the trash. And, you know, we had 13 people in a room coordinating around a duct bank that uh, you know was supposed to go at this elevation, but actually got put in six inches low, meaning all of the stuff that we just moved and coordinated in 3D is now conflicting with where it actually is. Um, you know, and if, it's, if we hadn't spent that three hours with 14 people, things would have worked fine. <laughs> you know? And so, um, you know, I, it, to me, it's just the big head scratcher is, you know, how do we close that loop, um, you know, between the, you know, so the digital, the digital twin, the digital, uh, you know, representation of the building has become so crucial to the process over the last 10 years. Um, but we haven't really closed that loop to make sure that the two things don't get out of sync. And that, that, you know, that means there's a lot of waste in the system um, and that drives people crazy. So we got to close that loop. I um I think when you say that it's so funny. I was on a, a high rise job in Miami, and um we had this APM who had been tasked with coordinating um, the mechanical systems, and and he was he we had already coordinated the height of the fire sprinkler system in the first seven levels, which is a parking garage, and he literally had the height of all the fire sprinkles coordinated perfectly, um and he went out on the site to do an inspection, and the guy had just dropped all of them. They weren't even running the right space. This guy, Mike Marcus, was like the CrossFit champion for Miami. And if you know anything about Miami, being the CrossFit champion of Miami, you're a big guy. So he went and got a hacksaw 
and literally cut out all the fire sprinkler on like two levels and just laid it on the ground and was like, you're doing it again. And like, these guys are yelling in Spanish. Mark is like, he's going through and just ripping the shit out. It was the funniest moment I've ever seen, but he's like, we're paying you to install it how we coordinated and I'm not going to deal with this. But it was the first time I've ever had someone just be like, no, I'm not, we're not doing this. It's coordinated. You signed off on it. It's coming down. But they, they reinstalled it. And I, I was, I was kind of blown away, but it's the first time someone was just like, no, I'm not going to tolerate this. And they got it right. They did get it right. They Second get it right. They got it right <laughs> after that one. And that's that's the thing about checking. Like right now, we never check work on job sites, right? Really? Unless until something has gone wrong. It's like really? if you can just invert that process, you know, what we've seen on a few jobs that implement the tools, right? Is if they just check the first level, right? Really robustly. And then people go, oh crap, they're watching. Right. No, no, completely. All the other stuff goes in right. And it, but it's just like changing that culture is so hard to do in our industry. Oh, it's kind of walk every level. This guy would walk every level. Um, typical copying up, she checked typical levels going up to make sure everything was centered. He was like a nightmare to these subcontractors, but everything was right. Everything was spot on on this building, and it was amazing. It was his first time coordinating a building. So everything was meticulously coordinated to the nth degree, which wasn't great, but um, all good. Well, I think we're up uh, 9.52. I'm going to open it up for questions. If any one of the questions, if any of the participants have questions, please put it in the Q&A box. There is a, um, if you look at the bottom of your screen, there's a Q&A tab. If you click on that and type in your question, um, it'll pop up for us and we're happy to, happy to answer these. If you have it directed to any one of these people, I take reality capture for Kelly. General contracting, mechanical to Brad, and architecture. Well, all of them have done architecture. So focus on Ryan, <laughs> since he is the practicing architect specialist um, right now. Um, and I guess we, y'all spoke so well, no one has any questions. Um, all right. Well, I guess we can call it early. Um, I appreciate everyone for joining today. Um, I know it's been kind of a crazy year. Um, I hope, well, here we go. Not all questions, but there we go. Thank you, uh, Azusa, Azusa. Sorry, I'm, I'm terrible. I'm from the South. I butcher names. Um, <laughs> my name is Buck. I'll throw that out there. That should tell you enough. Thank you. He said, not a question, but a great conversation. No problem. Thank you for being um, understanding of that. Um, so uh, thank you so much. I, I appreciate the panelists for coming on. I hope we get to see each other in person um, soon. Ryan, thank you for participating. Kelly, Brad. Thanks for having um, me. Always appreciate y'all taking time out of your day uh, to join us. Um, I'm going to go on and call it. Uh, we'll both post this recording um, later on on LinkedIn. We'll give y'all links to it. So if you want to share it, blast it out. Um, and, and, I, and I appreciate everybody for joining. Thank you for coming out to us. This has been a Midwest University speaking panel. And um, check us out um, at Bimbox ATG. And check these guys out at their companies. We'll throw links up. All of them are specialists. And also, if you use point clouds, I, I can't stress this enough. If you use point clouds, if you've ever been in a jam like Brad, where you have a crazy pick and, and crazy tolerances and are, are using a laser scanner, um, get ClearEdge 3D. Um, get Edgewise. The Edgewise is the product that takes a point cloud and automates it to a model and Verity is a product. My favorite, we were doing, I was doing a podcast with Kelly, or a webinar with Kelly. Uh, Verity takes your point cloud, compares it in Navisworks to your model. Things that aren't existing in the point cloud show up as um, not missing. So if you're missing a column, for example, it shows up in red, um, which is always scary if you've which gone up a floor which you would think would never happen, but it's, we have found this on two jobs. I, just, I've, I've seen it. <laughs> second job with a column missing. And I'll, if it's okay, I'll give a shout out. Um, uh, we've got this series on LinkedIn called Stand to BIM University. Uh, if anybody's into reality capture or wanting to get into it, stuff like that. Uh, we have wonderful panelists like this. I'm probably gonna have to, now that I know Brad did this project, I'm gonna be dragging Brad into one of these. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, Ryan, if you got any cool stuff, you're obviously welcome, but we just have panelists. We, we kind of go through different parts of the process. Super duper fun.
So. Yep. All right, guys. Thanks so much. Everyone have a wonderful day at work and thank you for joining us.